Um, my name is Tara Tadris Whitehill, and I'm currently in Istanbul, Turkey, which is where I live. And I'm American originally, but I've been living in the Middle East for over 10 years. Um, I'm a photojournalist, and uh, I was staffed with the Associated Press. And now I started my own company, Vignette Interactive, three and a half years ago. We do uh, media production and software development. Um, so I started in photography, not really the normal way. I went to school uh, for engineering and international relations, and then at some point realized that I didn't want to do either of those things as a career, and that I really want to do photography. And I took um, photography classes at my university, but it wasn't really a school for that. In fact, you couldn't even minor in photography. Um, and so. It was just some visual classes, which were good, but nothing that um, was going to give me a uh, degree. And so I, um, after I graduated, I went back to New York and started assisting photographers and learning kind of just the, the basics of being in a business for photography and assisting. And that was kind of um, good and also a little bit of a... Uh, it, it takes a lot to be an assistant, you know, feeling like you're just a grunt sometimes. But um, I learned a lot about the business and different types of photography that I didn't want to do. Um, but I also was trying to figure out the things that I was interested in. And so uh, I started doing a project um, very, I've always been very uh I've always been very interested in women related issues. And um, there was a I saw a woman on talking about this project that she was doing about women activists who had had abortions and they were all wearing a t-shirt that said, I had an abortion. And, um, it was a very simple t-shirt, but it was a very powerful statement. So I contacted her and I said, I'd really love to do a portrait series of women wearing this t-shirt. And she said, sure. Why don't you photograph everyone who's been in my documentary? Uh, and, the woman who was doing the documentary, Jennifer Baumgardner, she was great. And so I went around and did a lot of portraits of different women that were in her documentary, including um, Barbara Ehrenreit and uh, Gloria Steinem. And and then I um, took that and I made it into a gallery show and, um, and made them life-size. So like when you were at the gallery show, the pictures were looking at you as if they were in the room with you and then put their stories next to them. So it was very simple format, black and white, and then just telling their story because I think abortion can be in America a pretty faceless issue. People don't want to talk about it, even if they've had abortions. Um, so I, um, I thought that that was a way to kind of spark conversations with people. And, um, and someone at the show was talking to me about it and they said, you know, this is, this is, this is photojournalism. And I hadn't really experienced photojournalism except to see like, um, spot news. I have, like I said, my knowledge about what like different types of photography were just from like learning on the ground. And I was like, really, this is, this is what you would consider also photojournalism. And so that was kind of the beginning of why I decided to do it. And then at the point where I really decided to be a photojournalist, I also realized that New York City was a very hard place to be a photojournalist. Yeah, so I did the exhibition with the women who were wearing the t-shirt, I had an abortion in 2005, and I shot it on my Hasselblad um, and in black and white. And I did that because I wanted to blow them up big. And at that point, the digital um, choices were not necessarily as easy if you wanted to sh like blow something up that big. And I love Hasselblad. I mean, if I could be shooting film on a Hasselblad for the rest of my life, I'd be a happy camper. But um, you know, that hasn't really worked out in terms of if you want to do like fast paced stuff. But anyway, so that I still have my house a lot. I just haven't used it in years. Um, so that was kind of the beginning of the, the reason that I realized that I could make an impact with, um, my photography and work on issues that were really important to me. And that's why I decided to focus on that and not other types of photography.
so in terms of um, be ending up in Egypt, I I never thought that my path would take me to places like a revolution happening on the streets of Cairo. Uh, but yeah, if you look at my most recent blog post or my one I did a week ago, um, I I realized like how in the middle of the action I was sometimes and. Um, it was definitely a far cry from starting to do portraits of uh, uh, women activists in New York City, but it's amazing how your trajectory can take you lots of different places once you decide to do uh, photojournalism. When I, I decided that I wanted to do photojournalism and work on women's related issues, I realized since New York was too expensive and there were too many people calling themselves photojournalists there, I really wanted to go somewhere where I could focus on women-related issues and um, and kind of attach them to the news cycle. Uh, so I decided on the Middle East because I knew someone in Beirut at that time, and I thought I could start there uh, and see what happened and just see if I could like make a start of it. And uh, when I got to the got to Beirut, which was my first day in the Middle East. Um, was February 14th, 2005, which was also the day that Rafiq Kariri was assassinated. And I was standing on the uh, campus of AUB, the American University of Beirut, and we felt this massive boom go through us and uh, realized very quickly that it was a car bomb. And, uh, you know, it's one of those moments where you move to a place to do the thing and then you have to be like, run towards the big explosion or run away from the big explosion. So literally trial by fire. And um, I ran towards it and uh, realized pretty quickly that although I wasn't, I couldn't, I did try to sell pictures, but I mean, in Beirut, everything was like happening so quickly, like people had gotten those pictures out um, immediately. But I realized being there in the middle of like, a huge hole in the ground and pe people, um, you know, people trying to figure out what had happened and like obviously people had died. It was chaotic, but I felt totally okay in that scenario. I felt very calm. I felt like I could do this. And that was an interesting moment because instead of feeling like, um, you know, upset or anxious, I felt very almost like I could see everything happening from above, like that I was watching it and taking notes and feeling very aware, um, but also like that this was something that I could do. So after that, um, Beirut was too expensive for me. And I moved to Egypt because there was a presidential election. I say that in quotes that, because I didn't realize at that point that there really wasn't a presidential uh, election process when Mubarak was in power. But uh, that's how naive I was. But I did. Uh, I had heard that there was a woman who was running for president. And so I thought, oh, well, that would be really cool to uh, follow her on her campaign. She wasn't really running for president, as it turns out. It was more like a political statement. And that really didn't go very far. But um, in Egypt, it was very cheap to live at that point and also um, very easy to work without um a press card or a work permit. So I picked up work very quickly and, um, you know, things in Egypt start like where, well, there was a lot of stuff happening that people were interested in. And, um, so I worked for a local English magazine and then I started working for different international publications. Um, and then I became a stringer for Reuters and worked with them, uh, for a couple of years in Cairo, and uh, and then I was um, hired by the Associated Press. So then I was a staff photographer for four years. So just to clarify, um, Stringer means that you're hired on a day rate, um, that you're usually, it's a freelance position, and it just means that you're you're not usually uh, going to, you know, what your next assignment or how many days. Some stringers may have a certain number of days where they're contracted per month, uh, but usually it just means that you're per day and 
they can call you tomorrow or they may not. Staff photographer means that you are on staff with a newspaper publication or wire service, and then you are getting a salary no matter what. You are also, in my case, um, you know, they give you all your cameras. They uh, they also um, own all the images. So um, depending on each staff photography position, but usually at this point, if you're a staff photographer, uh, your company owns um, your photos and you can use them for your portfolio, but you can't resell them yourself. So when I'm working in a situation where um, the security issues are higher, um, we usually, me and my business partner, sit down and we make a, a security plan. So uh, we have all the contact numbers, the people that we're going to be with. Uh, we have apps on our phone that if we are in places where we have cell phone reception, which is a lot of places these days, that um, will track where you are. And if you leave certain areas, you can pinpoint yourself to say that you've left and come back so that that other person can uh, keep track of you. Um, and then just in terms of just doing your research, uh, making sure that you understand as much as you can before going into a situation what you are seeing. Usually that entails calling people, the like colleagues, or emailing people that you know that are there, talking to fixers, um, getting a sense of the situation and what is doable and what is not so that you really understand as much as you can before you get there. You never can fully see it until you get to the ground. Um, you'll always be slightly uh, surprised with what you find, I think, unless you've been to a country before and you know exactly what to expect. And even then things can change. Um, like my blog post said, you know, that you never know, but you always try to be as prepared as you can, um, you know, before you get there and then you're able to adapt, hopefully, uh, to the situation. In, in Egypt, when I worked there, a lot of times I would work with other photographers and would go around with other photographers because there was a safety in numbers. Um, and it's just dependent on the country and how you work. But because then I was working a lot more for um, you know, spot news or like, as in like quick moving news. So it would be like the daily news, whatever's happening that day. Um, and I wasn't like really getting into in-depth, um, documentary projects. So we were always moving around and doing different stuff and there would be protests or there would be this and we'd go from place to place. And people were always very suspicious of who you were. So if you were by yourself, it was worse. If you were with other people, then there was a way to sort of be like, figuring out if it was okay and also giving you kind of a backup. Um, so I always felt like in Egypt, it was better to kind of have, um, almost a buddy system so that you could, um, could handle everything a little bit easier. A fixer, just to explain, is someone who is a person who is usually local, who speaks the languages um, around that you would need to get by with, and who has contacts um, and or knows how to get things, just so that they're, they're helping you on the ground with whatever that is, from maybe getting a driver for the next day or trying to figure out the story in depth. And in the case, like for example, in Sierra Leone, where I went to go photograph um, Ebola survivors, um, the fixer there had been working with another, had been working with a, a staff reporter from the New York Times, Ben Solomon, and had been there for a while. And he knew, um, I mean, they had been working together for years, actually. And, um, and so he had kind of a knowledge of what Ben was looking for. And, um, and when Ben first was there, he met this guy, Arison, who was the person who started the Ebola football, Ebola football survivors club. And, um, and then when Ben left, um, I think like just being able to stay in contact with Arison and the people on the ground, like his fixer was helpful to just keep an idea of the situation, what stories he would be able to come back to. Um, so like just keeping in contact and then that's why we went back to continue doing those stories. 
for the football, um, the Ebola Football Survivors Club. Arison Trey was the guy who started it. And um, he and Ben met when he had just, um, he had had Ebola and survived. And, uh, and I believe it was like 40 um, people from his family had died of Ebola. And he and his mother were the only two um, of his closest relatives. He and his mother, like ever, like his brothers and his father died. Um, and so Ben stayed in contact with him after he did the initial story uh, with him. And then Arison um, told him that he was starting this football club for Ebola survivors because um, in general, Ebola survivors are stigmatized. Um, they can, people in the community feel like they are not, um, they shouldn't touch them, that they still could get Ebola or that they somehow are still um, have problems. So the football club was to bring people in the community of Kenema, which is where Arison's from, together uh, so that they could um, really kind of connect again. And Kenema was one of the hardest hit areas for Ebola. It was kind of like one of the places that it started in Sierra Leone. Um, and when I went to his house, it was very humble. You know, he's a lovely man. And he was like sitting out with some of his like extended family, little kids and stuff like that. And he went into his house to get changed and uh, was nice enough to like let me go in with him and as he's sitting in his room he's putting on his shoes and the first picture that I have of him is just in his room and um he's putting on and it's hard to see in the picture but um I tried to focus on it but it didn't come out very well to do it but he's putting on these like plastic jellies um as shoes and uh that's his football shoes and um he really loves them and like, but, you know, obviously it's because he doesn't have proper shoes and then these are the cheaper option. So he plays football in these clear plastic jellies. And I thought that was really powerful because, you know, in, he's in, from humble surroundings and he's doing this, but for the love of his, you know, the, for the game, he's like just using whatever he can and getting out there and playing. Um, so in terms of the the scale of a project and uh, specifically about um, Sierra Leone. Um, I actually was there to do another photo shoot about um, economy related to Ebola um, and that there were curfews in Sierra Leone, which were affecting the, the vendors and people on the ground. Um, but the day that I got there, um, uh, Ben Solomon, who I was working with, uh, won the Pulitzer Prize. So he left the next day. And um, in fact, that photo essay never ended up happening because by the time he was able to get around to um, writing or, um, you know, doing an article about it, uh, the curfew had changed. So they no longer had the same stuff. So all the stuff for that story never ended up um, going anywhere. Um, and then, so that was most of the time that I was there and I was doing that. The Ebola survivors football club was actually just a one day shoot and it was, Ben was supposed to do it. Uh, he wanted, he did do a, uh, a video for it. And, uh, that was mostly what the assignment was. And it went on the New York times website afterwards. And it was a really nice story about Arison and his football club. Um, and so we went for a day and another videographer came with us to kind of get some B roll. So that was the whole point was to do like photos and video for that one. And so we were just there for a day and we didn't really even like end up shooting until later in the afternoon. So the whole thing happened in like three or four hours. And the last pictures of the series are the people kind of having like a practice match and doing a shootout and it's starting to become night. And my last picture, you know, I couldn't even focus anymore. So that's when I stopped taking pictures because there was no lights on the football field. Um, so and then those photos, because it was mostly <clears throat> for a video package, uh, didn't get used. The only photo that got used was a thumbnail 
that was sent, uh, put on the front of the video um, for the beginning. And that was it. That was the only picture that went out from the entire trip to Sierra Leone, which happens sometimes, you know, like things change, especially with news. And that was it. Um, and then I submitted them for a uh, world press photo. And that was the first time that any of those pictures, um, were seen by most people. So it was funny because like, uh, until that point, um, you know, they, they were not, they were not out there. So this year I won um, a World Press Photo Award for the series I did in Sierra Leone on the Ebola football survivors. Uh, World Press Photo is one of the, I'd say, the premier organization for photojournalism. I mean, before I was even a photojournalist, I knew what World Press Photo was. Um, it's always been a place that I go to to see the best of the best. And... Um, you know, I think there's there's a lot of great photo contests in the world, but um, I think World Press Photo, in my opinion, is um, is the one that you want to. If you had to choose one to win, that would be it. Uh, I, of course, like the Pulitzer Prize is amazing as a as a, also um, a photo prize, but they also have other categories. So they have you know lots of different journalist categories from print to um, you know, everything else under the Pulitzers, but in world press is only photos and, uh, and well, they just started actually their, uh, multimedia, which includes video too, but they're the place that everyone has always gone to for, for looking for like the top in photojournalism. Um, and when I won this year it was amazing. I never expected to win. Um, I think like this kind of stuff is just to, um, even get close is kind of impressive. And now world press photo, um, if you are being considered for one of the prizes, they will contact you, um, to ask for the raw image. So I knew a little bit in advance that there was being considered for one of the, that I was in the last rounds, but I still didn't think that I would win something. Um, and, uh, and then when I won, it was, it was amazing. I mean, I think that in terms of recognition, it just really helps to know because as a photographer, there are a lot of different people that say they're photographers. There are people with their phones. There's people that are amateurs. There's people that are professionals. And you you don't know from one to another what that means in terms of, like, what they're doing or, uh, you know, if they're making their living from it, if they're truly professional, what, what does that mean? And, um, you know, when I was staff with the Associated Press, I felt like that was a legitimizing for me, factor of being a photographer or a photojournalist that I was saying I was staffed with the Associated Press and I wasn't, you know, a freelancer. I was like being hired full time. And I feel like that winning World Press was another point of feeling like, you know, if you're if you're if you're one of the get one of the prizes for World Press, you certainly can be um, say that you're um, you're you you kind of I wouldn't say made it, but like just that you are, you're, you're being considered with people that are amazing photographers and it's very humbling, but it's also an honor. And it makes, I think people around you kind of, when you say that, or people know that you've won a world press or that that's really, um, that they're, they understand what that means. And that's a, a big deal. Um, in terms of getting more work, I think that it hasn't necessarily given me, um, like a correlated assignment. Like someone was like, Oh, pick up the phone, call Tara because she won a world press. Um, but I do think that when I go and talk to clients that they, um, they know it. And I think that that gives like a kind of just a baseline, like, okay, so you know that we know you can do this job. Like this is something that you're, we are very sure that you can do. And I feel like that gives them like, um, almost, um, just an, uh, immediate understanding of the level of work that I can bring. So 
I think that um, there's a lot of things that go into being a photojournalist these days. I think that you do have to obviously hone your skills and know the stuff in and out. And also um, how to tell stories, I think, is incredibly important. Um, I also think that most people who are photojournalists have to have a lot of other skills like um, video and audio and I think there's a lot more to storytelling that's not just um, photos that gives it more of a rounded kind of 3D look that you can really uh, engage people with. Um, and I also think that you have to be very aware of um, the people that you're taking pictures of and what it's going to mean to them um, after you leave. And all those things, I think, are what um, when me and my business partners created vignette that we were really trying to do because we also have all the technical skills. We do, you know, all the media production and, um, software stuff, but we also know what it takes to work in these places and to not harm populations or people, um, once you're left. And we run into a lot of different, like, you know, vulnerable populations that don't want their faces used or, you know, are worried about people seeing them even being interviewed. And you have to be very careful about that and what it means to them. Um, Cause they're not going to know at even um, for the most part until like if something shows up on the internet and then that's brought to their attention um, or, you know, in a newspaper, whatever that is. So, um, you know, you have to kind of have these, think about these things as well. Um, and for uh, you know, NGO work also, you want to make sure that the NGOs aren't going to suffer as a result of something that goes out. You want to make sure that they are able to, their first and primary objective is to help the populations on the ground. And you want to make sure that you're helping with that, not hindering. Um, and so those are all these things that have to be, you have to consider now as a photojournalist. And I think if you don't, then you're not, you're not doing enough credit to photojournalists because, um, you know, it, it's not so easy as just to take a picture. It's just that you have to, um, you have to consider all the other things that go into it. And, um, I think there was a question on Twitter yeah. that you had mentioned before about what makes the moment that you take a picture. So, uh, maybe I should just go back to that for a second. Um, I think when I look for a photo, I'm looking for a larger, uh, story, I'm looking for, you know, that thing that will help me tell a story. So I'm looking for each in a, a series to be able to uh, continue from one to the other so that people understand what's happening. Um, but in the context of one picture, I think I'm also looking for a moment that is different, like a moment that will, where someone has done something that is an in the middle of an action, like you're not just sitting still, but there's something that they've done. It's a, an expression, a hand movement that gives it kind of, uh, it, it gives it a, um, I think it's just, it, it, it almost has not an action necessarily associated with it, but it feels like there's a movement. There feels like there's something that's not just, uh, you know, it gives you something to look at. It's, um, you know, and I think that that's really important when, um, anything from portraits to, uh, you know, news events, like just trying to find a moment that is a little bit different that, um, will catch people's eye and like make them look at the picture a little bit longer. Um, sure. Uh, so I think that, uh, as a woman photographer, I think there are a lot of advantages to being a woman and doing photography, you think you're invited into situations that you wouldn't necessarily be invited into with people's homes and traditional societies that where the women go and, you know, the men can't really comfortably stay. Maybe they can take a picture and then leave, but they're not going to be invited to stay. Um, this kind of stuff. And, you know, when I was, I mean, at, at funerals in like the West Bank and Gaza, like there would be entire rooms of women who, you know, they would wait for, a, you know, especially if someone had been killed by uh, an Israeli army, um, you know, uh, incursion or whatever it was that, uh, or, I mean, I mean, there's a lot of different stuff that happens there, but so whatever had happened, some sort of a uh, conflict that where some a Palestinian had been killed, there was um, 
the groups of women that would wait and and wail over the body and they would I always felt like when I went I would want to go and sit with them first and get kind of the moments with them before um, the body came and stay with them afterwards and the male photographers would jump in and jump out mostly and not really stay in those rooms because they didn't feel comfortable um, and I thought that that was really important because like I was also spending more time with, I mean, these women were, you know, their brothers, their husbands, their sons that had died. And that was really, you know, their lives. And I felt like I was giving them at least a little bit more of a representation, um, you know, when that kind of horrible event happens. Um, and you know, that, that to me is like, what's good about being a woman photojournalist. Obviously there's issues as well. And, you know, everyone deals with things from sexual harassment to, um, just feeling like someone won't give you an interview if you're a woman, uh, depending on the places you're in. So there, there's always that, but I think that the good outweighs the bad for sure. And, um, you know, as you look at women photographers, I think there are definitely ones that stand out, in the present and in the past, there are definitely not as many role models as there are men, um, unfortunately. But, you know, when I was starting out, I really loved Dorothea Lang and Diane Arbus and, um, and Margaret Burke White. Uh, those were older photographers, but I think that their styles are something that I definitely, at least initially, was trying to look at and make sure I could do some stuff that was like it. Um, and then, you know, in terms of my um, people that I would, you know, I'm honored to say are colleagues, uh, Andrea Bruce, uh, Lindsay Adario, um, Paula Bronstein. There's, there are some great women photographers out there um, and they kick ass. Um, you know, it's just that I think as you see, you see a lot of women that are younger who are photographers, but as they get older, you stop seeing like, sorry, photojournalists, uh, photojournalists. There's a lot of photographers, but it, photojournalists as women when they're younger, I think are out there. And then they kind of, um, you know, as they decide to, to have different things that they want in their life from a family to a home or whatever that they choose to not go out in the field as much. Um, and then you see a lot more men. And I think that's unfortunate, not that the choice has been made, but just that like when you're looking as a photojournalist and you're younger and you're a woman to see how you could do this when you're older, um, you only see a lot of men. And, um, you know, I think it's important to have those mentors to see that like it's possible to do all these things and still make it a career long term. Um, and when I was working in Egypt, the, the, the post that I did uh, two weeks ago or last week, about um, being kind of trampled during one of the protests. I mean, that is an example of where it didn't matter if I was a man or a woman. Um, you know, I was there and everyone treated me equally. And, um, you know, I was not harassed at that point. I No one was trying to uh, say you should leave because you're a woman, um, you know, and uh, I was as vulnerable by just being there as a photographer as anyone. Um, I was in, not in the greatest spot. <laughs> as you can see from the pictures, I ended up being right in the middle of like people clashing. Um, it was not the best call. And I didn't really know that I had done that until it was too late, which is why I just start kept taking pictures instead of leaving. I couldn't leave. Um, and luckily I came out okay. The pictures look a lot worse than I remember. I never, I was not hurt during that and uh, people just jumped over me. But um, yeah, it was definitely um, a, a moment that shows you where being prepared doesn't, you could still be humbled by that because you. I thought I knew Egypt and at that moment I was just badly prepared. Um, and, uh, you know, luckily, like it all worked out I'm Tara Todgers Whitehill. I'm a photojournalist and founder of direct founder and director of photography at Vignette Interactive. Um, you can find our website at vignetteinteractive.com and our blog at vignetteinteractive.com/blog.
Thank you so much.